Godric, a novel by Frederick Beekner. Chapter 5 of Peregrine Small and How Godric Came to Prosper in Trade. I think of Fairweather in tune, of Fairweather with his tongue aflame and sleepy, faithful tune. Have they withstood the years? Do they drape themselves like garlands over dead limbs still, and coil themselves for sun on rocks too high for weir to wet? Have they found it in their hearts to pardon Godric? If they but knew it was not the coldness but the warmth of Godric's bowels for them that made him drive them off. It's hard to fasten on the airy love of God when such as earthly tune, with jewels for eyes, slips on his belly th through the dust to pay his loving court. Tune slept in a jar, but at my every entering he'd rear his head and shuttle to and fro to weave my welcome. Fairweather guarded me. Whenever a man drew near, or monk or maid, he was fierce to strike and swift to sting. The trouble was he guarded me from God as well. Let God himself approach me down the path I made of prayers, and such a hissing would break forth from fair weather, then you would have thought the king of glory was my foe. For love of me, fair weather warded off the love of God, and since I loved fair weather for his care, I had to banish him with tune. I paid a smith to fettle me from the lids of two great pots, the iron vest I wear, to fret the devil in my flesh. And when I walk, it sounds to warn the world I'm near, the way that Aylred's cough warns me of him. Do my snake friends listen still for Godric clanking through the trees, or Godric's clank and Aylred's cough like the chanting back and forth of monks at mass? Does Godric listen still for them? He listens surely. There's no doubt of that, but ah, there are so many sounds. All those years ago, Tomball blessed my ears to hear the poor cry out for help, and I still hear them right enough. I hear them when the mouse squeals and the owl's cruel claw. I hear them when the famished wolf howls hunger at the moon. I hear them when old weir goes rattling past in weariness, and in the keening of the wind, and when the rain beats hollow on my roof. In all such sounds I hear the poor folk's bitter need, and in the dumb-tongued silence, too. But when melody wells up in the thrushes' throats, and bees buzz honey-song, and rock and river clap like hands in summer sun, then miseries drown in minstrelsy, and Godric's glad in spite of all. Yet sometimes, too, he's sad in spite of all. God knows, for there are other voices than the poor's. One is the voice of Peregrine Small, a weaver late of Bishop's Lynn, where I went to peddle at the fair not many months from when I left my sister dangling like a Christmas goose. Small's cloth was a weft so fine you could have pulled it through a lady's ring, and he himself was scarce less dainty. He had a man's parts and a silken yellow beard, but when he walked he swayed his hams from side to side, and when he opened up his bearded lips it was the simper of a maid came forth. Poor Small, he could not help himself. He didn't paint his face like some I've seen, nor seek out men to use him for a maid. But Mistress Small, they called him, and the lads were always making sport of him to see him blush and roll his cow-eyes heavenward. It's the voice of the same Small that echoes still in Godric's ears. Eek, eek, he cried, as if they sought to ravish him, and in the knock-kneed manner of a maid fled down St. Margaret's darkling nave. It happened thus. It was fair time, as I say. The town was full. Merchants were there from many parishes with tents and stalls and painted flags, and others from as far away as Flanders with their wines, dyes, hides, furs, herbs, and wares of every sort, too rare to name. Cattle and swine thronged through the streets till you walked up to your shins and dung. Notaries were busy with their wax to seal contracts and bargains, and whores flocked everywhere to seal some bargains of their own, wherever there were walls or bits of ground left dry enough to prop up their bums against Jack Plowman's huff and puff. From miles around, the rich and poor alike came out to gawk at dogs and kerchiefs, standing on their heads, or bears that jigged and one sick lion riding on a sumpter mule, his great tongue lolling. Magicians drew live doves out of the air, as easy as thimble riggers drew pence out of Dunce's pockets, and the Jews in their horned caps and yellow badges sat in booths to weigh out silver at the rates of gold. A Jew named Haggai sparked the tinder of that moiling time. 
As chance would have it, in years and heft he was about the same as Peregrine Small, and like Small too he had a yellow silken beard. Haggai turned Christian, that's where it began. Perhaps he turned to Yezu truly in his heart, ruing the bloody mischief of the cross the Jews had wrought. Perhaps it was because he was so fair of hair and face he hoped in time to pass for Saxon. Perhaps, since nothing humans but not a broth of false and true, it was the two at once. In any case, no less a high and mighty lord would be the one to baptize him than Ranulf Flambert, Chancellor, who traveled north to do the business of the king. King William Redhead's business ever was to milk the land of gold and silver, till it cried for mercy, and Flambert, called the torch, was he that pulled the teats for him till they hung dry. Flambert was as sharp a rogue as ever broke wind in a mitre, nor was this the last that Godric heard of him, for their sails were set on courses doomed to cross again. But one day's evil is enough each day, and that day sprang from Haggai's hallowing. The Jews caught scent of it and flew into a heathen rage. They wanted Haggai's blood for playing false, and to draw it they were hot to batter down St. Margaret's door. This door was bolted fast against the hurly-burly of the fair, but the Jews thumped on it with their fists and feet and pikes till all the Christian folk within believed their hour had come and called for help. What came was more than help or less. Christians came and Jews came, both magicians, whores, and thieves, and all who traveled to the fair to buy or sell or gawk. Everybody with a nose for hey-diddle-diddle and danger ran to fill the square and Godric too, his own great beak a quiver. He'd bought the hair of women cheap at nunneries, where it was cropped, and when the ruckus started up, he was selling it dear to Jones and Jills to plait their own thin tresses. St. Margaret's door fell down at last. The crowd pressed in like sheep, and Godric too. Inside there was a churchly dusk and quiet. Flambert and Haggai both had fled. A flock of Christians cowered around the stoop. A stout priest raised his arms in vain for peace. And then, for want of other foe, the crowd turned on itself. They went to it pell-mell. The vengeful Jews were routed soon. Then it was Christian fists that bloodied Christian snouts, and Christian staffs that cracked hard Christian pates like nuts. I myself was mounted on some knightly tomb, crowing like a cock and laying about me with a stick to clobber all who threatened me, when all at once I heard a feeble mewing at my feet, and turned to find this peregrine small crouched down for shelter there behind the tomb. Stand up like a man, weaver, I cried, and thwacked him hard across the back to stir him. Puddling the floor for fright, he stood, and be it ever on my head a brace of a proned Yorkshire cobblers, saw him then, and took him with his yellow beard for Haggai. They set up a cry, and in seconds tore the clothes off poor Small's back. They aimed to mock how he was circumcised, and work God knows what other mischief on his flesh. And had they only held him long enough to find his parts as whole as theirs, it might have saved his skin." But Small broke free and fled them naked down the nave. His soft flesh flickered white as milk through St. Margaret's shade. He hooted, eek, with what by then was half of Yorkshire on his tail. He doubled back then, as I have seen hares do. Who can say but that he thought to find in me his only friend? And so I might have been indeed, but even as he threw himself into my arms, the pack was on him. The cobbler stabbed him with their awls in throat, breast, belly, while Godric, drenched in blood, fell back beneath his broad-beamed spouting corpse. The folly of the mob killed small, and greater follies followed still. First, word went round it was the Jews that killed him. They said that Small had come upon a Jew dishonoring a Christian tomb, and pointed to the puddle Small himself had made to prove that they were right. When Small set out to drive the villain off, they said, six other Jews leapt forth. These six, it seemed, the doughty Small did battle with, unaided and unarmed, till one crept up by stealth to pin him from behind, while yet another jabbed him in the side, just where Roman lance pierced Christ. Thus Weaver Small died, Peregrine the martyr. Second, they claimed the blood of martyred Small worked miracles. A man born dumb prayed three whole aves through through aloud, without one fault, when but a drop of it 
was placed upon his tongue. A silver coin that chanced to fall in it was turned to gold, and from the holes the awls had dug, a mist was seen to rise that shaped itself into a holy cross. Third, there were folk that vied to give as much as six French knives or a pair of ivory combs for a scrap no bigger than a leaf of the garment Small had bled upon. That garment was Peddler Godric's own, of course, for Small had bled and died in Godric's arms. He peddled it off in bits and pieces to the last dank thread, then slid a cat's throat on another still and peddled off as much again. Who knows? He might be peddling cat gore still, but that m the mighty flambard called a halt. Already a score or more of Jews had paid for Small's death with their skins, and flambard feared that, as the martyr's fame spread farther yet, more Jews would fall to Christian zeal. He knew that each Jew fallen was a Jew that the less to lay a golden egg whenever William Redhead cackled. So Flambert sent the word if Godric wasn't gone from Bishop's Lynn before the sun went down, he'd never see it up again. And Godric went. He paid for passage on a boat bound north, and after three days upwind battling, reached an isle girt round with cliffs so steep there was no place to moor except an iron ring embedded in the stone. He had them make fast there, then scrambled up the rocks to wait until the boat was gone to work his stealth. Thus, Master Reginald, set down in your book how it was, through a martyr's death, that godly Godric's peddling prospered, and how the Chancellor of an anointed king was the only one by whom he first set foot on Holy Farn.